often from the internet, um, mostly. I did some modifications, of course. Um, and so if it's a little rough around the edges, that's because it wasn't something I created on my own. So bear with me. Um, so um, just the first couple slides are regarding Envision New Mexico and our conference and some of the ground rules. Um, you should have these memorized because there will be a quiz at the end. And by the way, Dr. Cower and um, Kevin graciously went over uh, a number of our rules uh, just a little while ago. Thank you, okay. Dr. Rifkin and Kevin. Um, disclosure, I have nothing to disclose. Um, just a couple of things. Molina and now Blue Cross Blue Shield um, have both signed on and partnered with Envision to um, help prevent ramifications of childhood obesity. Therefore, if you have a patient who has either Molina or Blue Cross Blue Shield and you present them at this session, there is a reimbursement code and your clinic or practice will get reimbursed um, from these insurers um, and we can help you through that process. There's also a follow-up reimbursement, um, and so it's an actually fairly um, cost-effective way to do this. So uh, if you need more information about that, please let us know. Uh, and here's the information about Blue Cross Blue Shield. Um, again, we'll do roll call um, after this talk. So let's start out with the natural history of type 2 diabetes. As, as mostly pediatric providers, um, many of you who have finished your training in whatever field um, probably didn't spend a lot of time on this disorder because this was historically a disorder of adults specifically over the age of 40, which used to be one of the criteria for its diagnosis. But now we're seeing um, people in their 20s, people in their teens, and unfortunately some people in their first decade of life um, developing this adult chronic disorder. And so it starts really with some genetic susceptibility, and then we add to that environmental factors, um, including obesity. Um, excuse me, I have allergies as well. Um, so in the presence of this genetic susceptibility, environmental factors, and obesity, um, the vulnerable person or populations go on to develop insulin resistance. Now the body's able to compensate for this by making more insulin. So the body doesn't use insulin very well, but it's able to make enough so that glucose levels maintain in the normal range. And that prevents any problems from occurring. But that then can lead to some manifestations of the metabolic syndrome, including high blood pressure, and including a low HDL cholesterol and a high triglyceride, and early signs of impaired glucose. So either the fasting glucose or the random or postprandial glucose may be elevated, not to the diabetic range, but high enough that it's not considered normal. And that's then pre-diabetes. And then at some point during this process, um, everything kind of goes awry, not enough insulin is being made, and the body still doesn't respond to it well, and therefore glucose levels start to go up, and that is diabetes. Then in the next ensuing years, that hyperglycemia from the diabetes leads to diabetes complications, including macrovascular disease, which we call atherosclerosis, I can't say it, sclerosis, so large blood vessels, including those of the heart and those of the brain, become damaged, and then we get coronary artery disease and strokes. Small vessels also are affected, including those um, of the eyes, of the nerves, and of the kidneys, um, leading to the complications of blindness, renal failure, coronary heart disease, amputations, and ultimately and usually premature um, death. So again, a disease of the adults that we're now seeing in children, um, and we're already seeing the ramifications of that by early complications, again, in 20, 30-year-olds, and even in some teenagers. Yes, Dr. Rifkin. Dr. Cowan, if you would, before you leaving this slide for the next one, would you please reiterate what you had said about the phase of insulin resistance, or what I think you've called pre-diabetes, pre <laughs> wherein, with regard to 
Uh, the triglycerides and the HDLs, I think you mentioned. Okay, so, right. So, in, in early insulin resistance, the body is, over to, is able to overcome its inability to use that insulin effectively or efficiently by making more. But in that process, um, other parts of the body that are resistant include the liver. And the liver, in response to sensing not enough insulin or insulin resistance, decreases HDL and raises triglycerides Thank for you. reasons that we don't really understand. Mm -hmm. um, and so even before we see high blood sugar, we'll see abnormalities of a low HDL and a high triglyceride. And that would be a sign of what I do call pre-pre-diabetes, or they're on their way. Oh, look. <laughs> there, well, you probably can't see this, but there are little things flying by. So what do we know about type 2 diabetes in youth? Most of what we know is about adults. So we know that um, the rates of diabetes across the board have increased significantly in the last 50 years. Well, this is from 1958 um, to 2010. So around the, there's been a steady incline, but then in the mid 90s, the slope of that increase has increased significantly. Um, where we used to have 1 million people with diabetes, now we're up, we're actually past this, we're at about 26 million now, and the numbers keep going up by about 1 to 2 million per year. Uh, so we know a lot of things counted for this increase around this 90s period. Um, certainly autom automation, increased use of technology, increased um, access to fast food, increased technology to make processed food and to use shortcuts such as high fructose corn syrup. And we also know that our physical activity needs declined because now you could push a button on the elevator or the escalator instead of walking up the stairs. You can push a button to open a door instead of opening a door yourself. You can push a button to change the television channel, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The childhood obesity or the childhood um, diabetes rates have followed this pattern, but at a lower level until recently which we'll see. These are, um, you may or may not have seen these. Oh, they're gonna go through. I gotta go back when they're done. Red is bad. They started without me. So before I go back to them, because I want you to see them again, is they started tracking obesity rates and diabetes rates by state um, in the um, in the early uh, 1990s, and what they did in the um, in the middle of 2000 around 2010 is they started making these graphic maps to show pretty graphically how these numbers have increased significantly, and so white is normal, and then as it goes from light orange to dark red. That means higher and higher rates of, um, of both obesity on, on the left map and diabetes on the right map. So I'm going to just go backwards, backwards, backwards. This is cutting it by every couple of years. Um, and so let's see. This is 1994. Can we go, go back one more, Dr. Cullen? Perhaps not. So we'll start with 1994, and then you can see about half the states are normal or white. We see more orange, that's worse. Now some southern states are red. Dark red's really bad. 2004, 5, 2007, and 2010. Oh. Over half the states, more than 30% of people were obese, and about 15% of people have diabetes. So in kids, is this an epidemic? We know it is in adults, but what about in kids? Well, type 2 diabetes has accounted for 8 to 46% of all new cases, including both type 1 and type 2, referred to pediatric centers. It depends what state you're in. If you're in southern state like Mississippi, those numbers are a lot higher than if you're in Colorado. And it includes both type 1 and type 2, and we know that type 1 is going up, and that's probably due to an increased rate of autoimmune diseases across the board going up. 
but it's not nearly going up at the rate that type 2 is in the pediatric population. We know that Native American youths are particularly, youths, I can't say that word, are particularly vulnerable to diabetes, both because of their strong genetic predisposition, but also because of their higher rates of obesity um, and their higher rates of poor access to healthy foods. So looking at the Pima Indians in the 15 to 19 year age, 19 year old age group, 50, point, or 50 out of 1,000 Pima Indians adolescents had type 2 diabetes. It's lower for all American Indians and slightly lower for, native, uh, for Canadian indigenous people. Prevalence of type 1 is 1.7 1 per 1,000. So this has surpassed type 1 in prevalence um, as the, as the type of diabetes. And we know that the magnitude of type two is probably underestimated in kids. Some are, it's underestimated because some are not yet diagnosed, but they're running around with it, developing complications. And some are misdiagnosed as type one for um, a variety of reasons, which I'll get into a little bit later. So it is starting to become an epidemic. It's not quite there yet. Um, but it's going to come upon us quickly. So is the pathophysiology the same as that in adults? We do know that type 2 is associated with significant beta failure and insulin resistance, and that's what we see in adults as well. So early on, we make a ton more insulin, but over time, the pancreas has to the pancreas stops being able to do that, and so then we get pancreatic beta cell failure on top of the insulin resistance, and that's when blood sugars go up. We also know that puberty is a bad, bad thing. I know because I have a 14 and a 12-year-old. <laughs> But they are, <laughs> but puberty, regardless of your body habitus, increases insulin resistance. And that's because all of those hormones, in addition to making us crazy, um, are making us insulin resistant. Um, so let me see, where's my little thing? So right now we're talking about the before diabetes. So we're setting up the scenario for insulin resistance when we allow our children to be obese, to be physically inactive, and to not eat healthy. And that insulin resistance leads to the increase in the um, insulin production, which eventually fails, and then we're at the point where hyperglycemia and or diabetes will occur. So again, there's two defects in type 2 diabetes. First, we've got the insulin resistance, the body not using the insulin well and needing more of it to compensate. And over time, the body's ability to make that insulin fails and we get a beta cell defect or deficiency. Starts with pre-diabetes, slightly high sugars, and progresses to overt diabetes and hyperglycemia. That process is accelerated in the presence of obesity and is associated with hypertension and lipid abnormalities, as we have already discussed. It's um, accelerated in the setting of a sedentary lifestyle, even independent of body habitus. And certainly there are genetic and ethnic components to the underlying insulin resistance. And then puberty happens. So we see a huge um, raging of hormones um, that are supposed to help us develop from a child to an adult, but those hormones also have the property of making our bodies more insulin resistant. And normally we could handle this because um, it's just going to go away. It's a temporary thing, so they keep telling me puberty doesn't last forever. Um, and then the body goes back to being as insulin sensitive as it was. Unless, of course, there's all of these other factors, um, such as obesity, poor eating habits, and poor um, physical activity, which I'm showing again. And in girls, it's, it's not worse. It's just more recognizable because their menstrual irregularity occurs. And so it's something we can identify um, and th therefore name as polycystic ovarian syndrome, which is associated with insulin resistance and the risk of type 2 diabetes. This is a teenage girl. 
going through puberty. Um, you can tell, see, she's got significant facial hair. She's got a little bit of acne. She actually has some signs of, of frontal balding, um, but not a good sign. This is a very severe case of uh, polycystic ovarian syndrome in a, a, a young female who is eventually diagnosed with type 2 diabetes um, in addition to all of its ramifications. I have no idea what's going to be on here. Again, we need the genetic defect. Uh, in type 1, there's autoimmunity. Uh, we get toxicity of fat cells around the pancreas that contribute to the beta cell defect, as well as the hyperglycemia itself can contribute to the, the beta cell defect that occurs in type 2 diabetes. And then certainly <laughs> some things that have happened prenatally pre-program the beta cells to die at a specific time, and so they die earlier in the setting of interuterine stress, such as in uterine growth tardation or maternal diabetes, whether it's gestational type 1 or type 2. This was a study that was done um, looking at kids who were obese um, and were going to go through puberty pretty soon. And then they followed a group who had normal glucose tolerance, MGT on top, or impaired glucose tolerance, IGT on the bottom. Of those 84 who had normal glucose tolerance during puberty, the majority of them went on to continue to have normal glucose tolerance. However, eight of them progressed through puberty with impaired glucose tolerance or prediabetes. Of those who had impaired glucose tolerance at baseline, as they went through puberty, some of them, almost half, reverted back to normal glucose tolerance. Further evidence that the hormones of puberty cause insulin resistance, but it can be temporizing depending on the other factors going on. Ten of them persisted with impaired glucose tolerance, um, and almost a third of them progressed to type 2 diabetes. So we know from this that impaired glucose tolerance is certainly a risk factor for type 2 diabetes, but things can go back to normal. So it is important to sort of take a deep breath and wait and see what's going to happen, um, but paying attention to things over time. This is what the curve of the beta cells look like in adults with type, who are progressing with type 2 diabetes. We know that after, at about minus 12 years from diagnosis to diabetes, they have 100% beta cell function. All the beta cells can work at 100% capacity. And then over the next 12, 10 to 12 years, we see a decline in beta cell output of insulin so that by the time they're actually diagnosed with type 2 diabetes, they only have about 50% of their beta cells functioning. So they've got 50% less insulin than they had before, and that's not enough to prevent hyperglycemia from occurring, and so it does occur. And then that curve continues to decline over time, so that by six years, they only have 40% function. By 10 years of having had type 2 diabetes, that's not well controlled. They really don't have any very good beta cells, and most of them then need to go on insulin. So type 2 diabetes is a progressive disorder that usually culminates in an insulin deficiency state and insulin resistance. In kids, however, we think that this slope is markedly um, um, accelerated to the point where these kids go from having 100% diabetes at minus 4 years um, and then are diagnosed four years later, and then lose most of their beta cell production by about six years. So we think the process is much more accelerated, um, so it's not exactly the same. We're not sure why. It may have to do with they're just not metabolically mature, um, or a variety of other reasons. It may be that the underlying obesity metabolic syndrome is worse in these kids and they're metabolically programmed in a different way and lose beta cells more quickly than if they've had, sorry, um, Dan, than if they've had beta cells for 40 years and then all of a sudden have problems. Yes, sir. Oh, thank you. I appreciate your completing your thought there, Dr. Cowher. And so what is depicted here essentially is that in youth, 
the, the accelerated uh, destruction of B cell function is greater. And that in youth, what, well, what occurs in adults perhaps over a dozen years could occur in youth in one third that time. Yes. Going from 100% at minus four years. Exactly. Down to 50%. Yes. Okay. Jane. Thank you. When you say beta cell function, do you mean beta cell viability too? So are those actually, it's not just that you lose function, you actually have loss of the beta cell mass. Yes. So beta cell apoptosis. Okay. A word I like to try to avoid saying because I never say it correctly, but that's how I say it, apoptosis. <laughs> Oh, apoptosis. So, so along with that, in pathologic terms, then, there can actually be a necrosis of the beta cells. Yes. Yeah, so what you see in the type 2, in the pancreas of a type 2 patient with diabetes is amyloid deposits, which are fibroid deposits, right. replacing the beta cells. Okay. Um, right. So you get beta, loss of beta cell function, but also loss of beta cells themselves. And it's accelerated. So is the presentation, so we know the pathophysiology is maybe a little bit different and accelerated, but is the presentation the same as in adults? So what we do know because of this accelerated beta cell loss that there doesn't appear to be this prolonged asymptomatic period of 10 to 12 years. Um, do not find undiagnosed cases on screening. I'm not quite sure what that means. I don't think I read that well. I think what that means, I don't know, because obviously if you screen somebody and you find a case, you're going to diagnose it. That's why we do screening. <laughs> but you don't, I mean, you wouldn't necessarily screen your average adolescent just unless there were, with screen based on obesity. But yeah. It may have more to do with. Practice. I think that's right. I think you're right. So you wouldn't necessarily do massive screening of kids. A kid is probably going to come to presentation um, without massive screening um, because they're going to have symptoms. But we do screen kids who have risk factors, and that's when we, we find them. And that's when we want to find them before they actually have the manifestations. Okay, so here's our slide. Now we're talking about um, ongoing hyperglycemia and or diagnosis. There's our little man. There's our circle. So um, this was a study that was done in some kids who were being diagnosed with diabetes, and they happened to be between the ages of 12 and 14. Ratio of girls was slightly higher than boys, 1.7 to 1. They were all obese, BMI greater than the 85th percentile. Most of them came from minority backgrounds. 74 to 100% had a family history of diabetes. And more than half and um, up to 100% had the marker, the one physical exam marker of insulin resistance, which is acanthosis nigricans. Dan. Yes, Dr. Cowher, and interestingly here, what we're looking at is a population of youth that we would call overweight. Yeah. Not even obese. Right. From the criteria that we're used to applying. Right. And still, the, the prevalence of these findings is quite high with acanthosis, nigricans, for example. Yes, and these, and these all are diagnosed with type 2. So they're a little bit different than the general population who are overweight or obese because we know they have type 2. Um, and, but the, the presence of acanthosis is just a really interesting marker. Um, there are better studies sort of looking at the role of acanthosis and insulin resistance, um, which we can do at, at another time. Um, but again, in, in these kids, most often who have overt diabetes, the diagnosis is made by symptoms, not by screening. What we usually pick up with screening is prediabetes. Um, and so in these kids who are diagnosed based on symptoms, they found that the A1C at presentation was 10, 10 to 13. Uh, all, uh, a significant number of them had experienced weight loss as part of their symptom complex. Um, 95% had glucose 
urea, which means an average glucose of greater than 150. Is that right, Jane? 150 to 200 is the threshold for spilling glucose into the urine. Mm -hmm. um, up to 79% had ketosis, and 5 to 10% had overt DKA, which we typically think of as a problem for presentation in a patient with type 1 diabetes, and we'll get into that in a minute. So these are some of the symptoms as well as signs um, that we see, some of the background information of these kids who are diagnosed with type 2. So what distinguishes type 1 from type 2 in youth with diabetes? This is an important and common question because of the way that they present. Um, I'm getting tired of this slide, so I'm going past. <laughs> It is a difficult diagnosis to make for a lot of reasons um, because there is a Venn diagram showing something. I think this is the last one, so I'm going to stop clicking and talk. So there's an overlap between type 1 and type 2. Sometimes we call that type 1 and a half. Sometimes we call it type 3. Sometimes we just don't call it anything. Um, so in the setting of childhood obesity, the risk for type 2 is high, but there are some kids who are type 1 who are obese. That's because kids are obese. So being obese doesn't prevent type 1 diabetes from occurring. It still is going to happen at the same rate it happened before. It just happens to happen because there's more obesity around. Um, we also know that there are monogenic forms of obesity, and these are fairly uncommon. It's called MODI. What does the M stand for? Something Maturity onset onset diabetes, diabetes of the, the youth, young. Or the youth. Do we even use that anymore? I don't I think mean, I haven't so. heard it for a really long time. I think people use it, but I don't know that they necessarily would use it accurately. Or right. So what it is is there are, are single genetic disorders that cause abnormalities in insulin signaling and it usually looks like a type 2 diabetes um, but it tends to occur in youth and now the the line between it and type 2 diabetes is further blue blurred since type since people since kids are getting type 2 diabetes with such frequency so there is overlap in front of these which makes us scratch our head a little bit more oh shoot i wasn't done Diabetes plus syndrome. So this would be like cystic fibrosis related diabetes, diabetes and some of the um, very obscure congenital syndromes, which I can't think of the name of one right now. Well, and I was thinking too, Jane, of some of the kids that are on transplant, you know, that end up with, you know, transient or iatrogenic diabetes for so, a period of time that they're on. So drug induced drug diabetes. Induced, and then. That goes away when they're, in most cases, when they come. Maybe or maybe not. I mean, and some is that kids more often type 1, type, in other words, they're insulin dependent during that time, or is it another medication to manage during, like, a transplant case? Mm -hmm. I think the ones I know are on insulin. The ones I can think of. Yeah, and, and insulin is used because all the other medications interact with the trans. I mean, there's just way too many interactions, and there really aren't with insulin. And another example, although perhaps different than what was intended by the author here, is the use of psychotropic medications. Yes. That many of the atypical antipsychotics and many even of the serotonergic antidepressants as we've talked about here in other installments, um, can cause significant weight gain, and certainly to the extent of prediabetes. Yes, and, and thank you. So lots of new drugs, and we're recognizing more and more adolescent sometimes need for some of these medications, and some of them are approved for use in these kids because of that need. Um, and so there's lots of reasons why somebody who's at risk because of obesity and being on one of these medications can then go over to the other side. And then of course there's puberty, which I just mentioned, which can be a transient cause of insulin resistance, but in a kid who's at risk can, can push them to type two diabetes. 
Did you say puberty is a cause of insulin resistance or parental resistance? <laughs> or both. Sorry. Yeah, it's both. a dual diagnosis. <laughs> Apologies it's, to the audience, I couldn't help that. It's a risk a for child and adolescent psychiatrist in the in the group. It's a risk for parental destruction <laughs> and beta cell destruction. <laughs> Go easy on those kids, Dr. Tolerant. <laughs> Um, all right, so here is kind of a, a table of some of the different presentations of type 1 on the left versus type 2 on the right. So wait, as many as 20% of kids who develop type 1 diabetes may be obese. Why? Because that's how many are anyway. That's how many <laughs> pediatric kids are obese. And some of them are just going to get type 1 diabetes. Like some of them are going to get lupus and some of them are going to get asthma and some of them are going to get this and the other thing. In type 2, all of them are greater than the 85th percentile unless they have one of these other kind of forms of diabetes for overweight. The course in type 1 tends to be rapid. In type 2, it tends to be slower with some exception. Um, but it's for that reason that we don't usually find overt type 2 or kids running around with blood sugars in the 3 and 4 hundreds undiagnosed because they have symptoms. Whereas in adults, it can be 5, 10 years that they're running around with these blood sugars um, uh, until we diagnose. Them. And why is that you don't see the, the in adults the difference? And you may have covered it already. In um, so one, we think that the kids progress more rapidly okay. than adults for type 2. Um, but also... Um, so one of the common presentations, which is not here right now, is polyuria polydipsia. So if you're an adult and you gotta go, you're just gonna go to the bathroom. Or if you're thirsty, you're just gonna drink. If you're a kid, you're gonna get a little whiny. Mom, I need more water. Mom, I need more water. And then mom's gonna go crazy and like, what is this kid drinking? And then they may have enuresis at night. You know, even 14, 15 year olds, because it is really polyuria. So there's those kind of things, even if they're not different than adults, they're going to come to the attention of the parent and then the pediatrician. So that would uh, explain why it presents more than it's found on screening. Right. Okay. Yeah. Um, and you'd be amazed how many adults run around for 10 years and they go to the bathroom every two hours. And, and they think it's normal, and they don't do anything about it. They don't lose weight, and kids tend to, tend to lose weight earlier. Um, and again, because all that sugar is going out in the urine, and so it's not being metabolized. But adults just eat more uh, to compensate, so they don't lose weight. Um, whereas kids may not have as easy access, so it, they tend to lose weight. They have these symptoms. It comes to the attention of the parent who brings them in. I can think of a lot of kids who were diagnosed when the PCP was working up a UTI. For polyuria. Mm -hmm. Right. Or, or it's or, frequent. I mean, it's frequency, and but it's not. And right. so they just did a urine because that's just what you do, and then, like, lo and behold. They're, right. Well, yeah, we have one of our nurse practitioners talked about that it, she was doing a sports physical. And so she did the urine for the sports physical. And he had been, you know, talked about a few things on her physical exam and, and history, but. Then the urine was the... And so, oh, now all these things make sense. Um, from DPT can be indolent. Oh, not found on screen. Okay, DKA, most kids... Well, half of kids with type 1 present with DKA. The other half come in because it is a pretty accelerated course. They're losing weight rapidly um, over one to two weeks, and parents get concerned, bring them in before they get DKA. Um, kids with type 2 can present with mild DKA, and it can even be severe if there's something else going on, some other stressor. Let's say they have a UTI from all that sugar sitting around in the bladder, um, and they develop a UTI or a pyelonephritis or some other stressor, which can be medical or non-medical, and they lose all of their reserve. And so they don't have any reserve to make enough, um, or they become more insulin resistant because of that stressor and stressor hormones, and they don't have enough insulin reserve to overcome that, they can present with DKA. Um, relative with DM, not so common in type one, but it is a genetic, there is a genetic predisposition, but almost all kids with type two diabetes have a relative who has diabetes. They're usually an adult, 
because again, this is a relatively new disease in kids. Comorbidity, kids with type one tend to have other autoimmune diseases such as autoimmune thyroid, adrenal insufficiency, vitiligo, celiac disease, B12 deficiency, um, et cetera, et cetera. Kids with type two have other diseases associated with insulin resistance, such as polycystic ovarian syndrome, the dyslipidemias that I talked about. And again, this isn't a disease, but it's a sign, acanthosis nigricans. 90% of kids in this, um, in this um, cohort had uh, acanthosis nigricans. C-peptide, um, I think I do have another slide on this, but I'm not sure. So I'm gonna talk about C-peptide antibodies uh, together. C-peptide, if you recall, is the molecule that is cleaved from pro-insulin before it becomes active insulin. So pro-insulin gets converted into active insulin and C-peptide in a one-to-one -one ratio. So if you've got any insulin around that your body's making, it's also making C-peptide. Um, and so if there's no C-peptide, there's no insulin. So we often used to use C-peptide to help us determine is this type one or is this type two. Um, and there are caveats. So we used to say if there's no C-peptide, it's always type one. If there is C-peptide, it's always type two. However, um, before they go into overt DKA and or after recovery from their first episode of DKA, they get a honeymoon period um, where the body goes back to making some insulin because whatever stressor was on board was hopefully fixed. So now they got a little bit more insulin, so they're going to do okay for three, six to 12 months. And if we measure C-peptide at that time, we're going to find it. So then we're going to scratch our heads. On the other side of the equation with the type 2 patient, um, they may get what we call beta cell toxicity. So all of that fat, all of that glucose causes the beta cells to freak out and they stop producing insulin for a period of time because they're in shock. In addition to not making insulin, they're not making C-peptide. So if we measure it during that time period, we're going to find it low or undetectable and we may mistakenly say, oh, you're a type 1. So it's not always clear cut. Antibodies, 85% of kids with type one diabetes demonstrate an antibody to insulin or to the insulin receptor. Not 100%, but 85%. So it's a good diagnostic tool. However, 15% of kids with type two diabetes also have positive antibodies and probably 10% of the population has antibodies to insulin without any form of diabetes. So it can be a false positive um, marker in patients with type 2 diabetes and may lead us to go and think that they have type 1. If it's not present in a type 1, we may falsely assume that they're a type 2 um, and then treat them as a type 2. So there's not a clear cut, oh, this is type 1, oh, this is type 2. Um, if we look at ethnicity, um, in this cohort, it was predominantly a dis type 1 was a disorder of Anglos. We know that is not true. Uh, at diabetes camp, more than 50% of the kids um, are not Anglo. So I think it depends on the population you're looking at. Um, Anglos do tend to have more autoimmune disease, um, but again, it depends on the community you're in. We do know that type 2, however, is a disease um, of people of color, including Native Americans, African Americans, Hispanics, Asians, Pacific Islanders, etc. It doesn't mean people who are Anglo do not get type 2 diabetes because they get it. So there are some clues here that can shift you one way or the other, and we tend to use all of them in how we decide, and sometimes we never figure it out. Here's a picture of acanthosis nigricans. This is a fairly moderate case. Um, you can see it's this velvety appearance, usually occurs on the nape of the neck. There are raised lesions. Um, these can be smooth or irregular like in this case. 
but they can occur in other places of the body, including the underarms, the extensor surfaces, um, the um, pubic areas, basically anywhere. Um, but this is a marker of insulin resistance. We usually don't see this in kids with type 1, although, again, if they are obese and they have any level of insulin resistance on board, you may see this. So it's not necessarily that its presence makes you go one way or its absence another way, but it is a helpful marker suggesting type 2. Okay, so we think the pathophysiology is a little bit different. Um, I didn't actually address, well, I sort of addressed the differences between presentation with adults, but adults do tend to go on for longer periods of time. It often comes up on screening, or they get um, seen for some other disorder, and then it gets uncovered that way. Um, whereas kids, they often present with symptoms um, which may or may not mimic type 1. There's a microphone tapping. Does someone in the audience have a question? I'm just going to pause for a second. Okay, well, let's move on to treatment then. So treatment regimes for patients with youth with type 2 diabetes. Here's my thing. There's the little man. Now we're talking about ongoing hyperglycemia or diagnosis of diabetes, goals of treatment. Um, goals of blood sugar are shown up here. This is back from 2000, and it's pretty accurate. And again? Uh, yes, go ahead. Okay. Um, so this is there a question? or just an unmuted mic? I'm going with unmuted mic. Fasting sugar, 80 to 120, postprandial 100 to 160, bedtime 100 to 160, A1C less than seven. These are type two parameters. Things change a little bit when we put people on insulin regardless of the type of diabetes depending on um, their risk for low blood sugars, because you might not want a kid who has frequent lows to go below 100. Um, but in general, for type 2 patients, these are our targets. And the target for A1C has decreased in kids with type 2 to around 6, 6.5. And that's because we're trying to prevent complications early on. When kids um, are on insulin, it's a little bit different story, only because, especially during adolescence, there's a lot more um, variability, and the, the primary goal is to avoid severe hypoglycemia from occurring while trying to get some control to prevent hyperglycemia. So two goals, get the A1C less than seven, get rid of the symptoms, in type 2s, where our one our goal is to try to maintain a reasonable body weight, if we're not talking about weight loss, we're at least talking about weight maintenance. Um, but for a lot of kids, weight loss is going to be a part of this program because, one, we can reduce the insulin resistance. We can revert back to normal glycemia if we make the body more insulin sensitive. Oops, wrong way. Sorry about that. We want to improve their cardiovascular risk factors, even in adolescence, because we know damage is already occurring. So optimize cardiovascular fitness, optimize healthy eating. If there's blood pressure issues, control that. If there are lipid issues, control that. Avoid smoking, um, et cetera, et cetera. These, as well as some other things, will help to reduce microvascular complications, so this is eye disease, kidney disease, and nerve disease. Um, and all, with kids with type 2 specifically, we want to improve their physical and emotional well-being. It can be somewhat traumatic to be diagnosed with a chronic adult type of disease as a kid, especially if you're in a setting where there's not a good support system in the clinical setting because there hasn't needed to be in the past. Um, you know, if they send you to group classes and everybody's 55 years old and you're 12, that's not going to go over very well. 
So we've got to adapt how we do this with kids um, and, and kind of think outside of the box a little bit. So this was a study involving the, uh, looking at the role of family in the management of type 2 diabetes. It was done in African Americans. It was a family study. One group got direct family supervision on how to deal with diabetes, um, what you know, how to help the kid learn how to be physically active, what to do with healthy eating, how to do the medications, how to do the testing, how to come back to the visit, et cetera, et cetera. The other group got no sort of supervision. It was just usual care. The group won at the end of the session, and I apologize, I don't know how long it was, but their A1C was 7.1, despite starting at an A1C of 12.5 at baseline. Um, group two also started with an A1C of 12.5 at baseline. They dropped theirs a mere 0.2%, but remained at 12.3 at the end of the study. Significant difference between the two groups. This wasn't a randomized, controlled, rigorous study, but it does show that the family intervention significantly lowered A1C. Um, what if this was due to a single component or a multiple component? We don't know, but I personally don't care uh, because it worked. So when we're looking at specific drugs for type 2 diabetes, we look at some of the targets where the pathology has occurred. So the pancreas is a target. We know that the pancreas doesn't make as much insulin as it's, as it's supposed to, so there's a relative insulin deficiency. We can give sulfonylurea type drugs, which are approved in kids, because that will beat out of the pancreas more insulin production um, to try to overcome the deficiency. Repeglinide and nateglinide are other agents that will also increase beta cell production of insulin, or we could give insulin itself. We can affect the gut um, by decreasing glucose absorption, and these drugs I do not believe are approved in kids at this point. Um, is A carbos? No. I don't think they, I, they're I don't not. Lictol, it's... I don't know that one. I don't know that one either. Um, but these drugs block the absorption or delay or slow the absorption of glucose in the GI tract. Therefore, you get nice levels of glucose absorption instead of high excursion, so you don't get hyperglycemia. Acarbose, we do use in adults. It's actually very safe because it doesn't get absorbed. It does have GI side effects because all that glucose that's not getting absorbed um, continues to flow down the GI tract, and it can affect, um, doesn't typically affect um, fat-soluble vitamins because it's really only glucose. Liver production, we can decrease that by using metformin, which we know blocks hepatic glucose production of, um, or hepatic glucose production. Um, and we can give drugs that sensitize insulin in the muscle. And the classic one in this category, in this category are the thiazolidine dione's or rosiglitazone, which is now all but gone, and pioglitazone. I'll talk about those in a second. Hmm. The ones that are circled are the ones that are approved. Uh, for use in kids with the caveat that don't use rosiglitazone, which I'll tell you in a second. So a couple of studies using metformin to improve glycemia in people with type 2 diabetes. Um, let's see where we're at. Fasting blood sugar, if they got metformin or placebo. The colors are off here. Um, so the first sugar if they got um, metformin, their A1, their fasting plasma glucose was 9. This is in European units. Uh, 9 times 18 is about 100 and... No. I can't do the math. It's about a sugar of about 200 or so. 200, 250. Um, and their fasting Oh, if they got placebo, their fastings were higher. So this was not a randomized controlled style. If they got metformin, their, a, their fasting glucoses went down significantly to 7. If they didn't, they stayed high. Looking at A1C, which we're more comfortable with, 
because uh, its in, units are international. A1C at starting point for the metformin group was 8.2, decreased by one percentage point to 7.2, statistically significant. Whereas that group who were on placebo had no change in their A1C over the course of this study. So this suggest, demonstrates that metformin does work in kids with type 2 diabetes and works better than placebo. In all of these studies, the kids undergo a, um, an intervention, um, a lifestyle intervention as part of the treatment. So the control group also got the lifestyle intervention. Uh, this was a study, two different side effect studies, an obese non-diabetic adolescents, so they had pre-diabetes, they were treated with metformin and they at, versus placebo. Those who got metformin had more abdominal discomfort than, and diarrhea compared to placebo, so we know there are known GI side effects with metformin uh, and more nausea as well in this study. Uh, another study also showed more diarrhea, abdominal pain in the kids who got metformin, uh, but nobody had to stop their medication because of the side effects, hopefully indicating that they were fairly mild in nature so that the kids could tolerate them. This was a study comparing metformin versus rosiglitazone in kids who were on no medications to begin with or those who had been on prior therapy, which was then stopped. Um, so if they were drug naive, they both started with an A1C in the mid eight ranges. And if they got metformin, that went down to 7.2. If they got rosiglitazone, that went down to about 7.6 over the course of 24 weeks. Um, if they were on a drug to begin with that was stopped at screening, Everybody went up um, until baseline. So whatever drug they were on was working, um, but we stopped it for the study, and then we started the study, and then they continued to go up for the first four weeks and then started to go down, and that probably represents the lingering effects of that drug that they were on six weeks before. Um, they don't tell us what it was, so we don't really know. Um, but there were probably lingering effects, which is why at week four, their A1Cs went up instead of going down. But then they, they began to decline over the next um, uh, 18 weeks, 16 weeks, excuse me, um, to the point where their final A1C was 8 to 8.2. Now, if we continued this for another several weeks, they'd probably get to the same point where those kids were who uh, were drug naive. Sorry, I'm going to stop for a minute. What this study tells us, the second part, is that um, as we do in adults, is we don't like to go from drug A, stop it, and then go to drug B. We like to drug, add drug B to drug A to get better control overall. So going from one monotherapy in diabetes to another monotherapy doesn't really work. You basically want to add drugs that work by different mechanisms to get an additive effect. Um, in this study, adverse events, there were more in the metformin group, specifically GI-related, um, compared to the rosiglitazone group. I'm going to go back because I think that's my last rosiglitazone slide. Rosiglitazone in adults has been demonstrated to not protect people from cardiovascular disease and may in fact increase risks and rates of some cardiovascular um, comorbidities. Therefore, it's not recommend, it has been pulled from the market um, all over the place, and I believe it's only available in the US for patients who have already been on it and have done well on it. So it is not recommended to start it on anyone at any time ever. But if they're on it and they've been taking it and they've done okay, then it's okay to continue it. So rosiglitazone is not long in our future. Pioglitazone, the other thiazolidine dione that's approved in adults, is faring a similar fate as rosiglitazone. It's just taking a little bit longer. So these are probably not good drugs to use in kids um, because we really don't know enough about them, it turns out. Um, and metformin tends to work so much better anyway. 
This was a study comparing a sulfonylurea type drug with metformin as monotherapy uh, in, P in kids with type one, type two diabetes. Um, Da, 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 da. What they found that there were similar beneficial effects in A1C reduction as well as uh, side effect profiles. So these drugs tend to work equally well um, in the pediatric population. Oh, look, there's rosiglitazone again. This was a, a study comparing metformin alone in blue or the lower line with metformin plus a lifestyle intervention in green or the middle line, or metformin and rosiglitazone together, the top line. And they looked at those who remained free of glycemic failure, which is a very strange statement, but it's, it's basically looking at drug failure. So how quickly does the drug fail? Uh, and so the first one to go was metformin, um, and so by 60 months, which is five years, half the people on metformin, half the kids on metformin alone failed it and needed something else. Um, really no significant difference if lifestyle was added to that. And there was a slight sparing if you added rosiglitazone. So adding rosiglitazone to metformin may improve how long those drugs work. If it was available. If it was available, <laughs> yes. Yeah, so let's move on. History is important. This was a study at 130 clinical practices, um, just looking at, dare I press it again? No, I dare not. Um, they were just kind of looking what was happening in this population as far as treatment. So just to give you an idea of what one practice is doing, these are type two patients. And starting at the bottom, 8% were on lifestyle alone. And lifestyle alone will work. It does work. But you actually have to do it. So if you can get a kid to lose a significant amount of weight, to be physically active, to eat healthy, they can actually revert from type 2 diabetes to non-diabetes. Or diet control diabetes is what we called it. So the minute they stop that lifestyle intervention, they're just going to go right back to where they were. Um, but you can control it with lifestyle. 44% uh, of people were on oral agents. Most of those were on metformin, followed by sulfonylurea, and very few were on the other drugs. Uh, and 48% of the patients were treated with insulin alone and on two injections. Insulin is a great drug. Insulin works. Insulin works in anybody who has high blood sugar. Um, in the adult world, until very recently, we've pushed away from using insulin as first, second, or third line, and often wait until the damage is already done before we start insulin. So have created a tsunami of fear, if you will, I just made that up, of using <laughs> insulin. <laughs> and you're saying we shouldn't be fearful. We shouldn't be fearful. Okay. Um, and we should use it first line, second line, and much earlier than we do use it. Um, and in, in certain populations, especially where there's a strong family connection and small communities, the fear is not insulin or injections. The fear is, if I go on insulin, I'm going to go blind, because that's what happened to grandma. They put her on insulin, and six months later, grandma was blind. And that's because they waited too late. That's because they waited six years too long. So if they had done it earlier, grandma still might be seeing and be on huge doses of insulin. But it's really hard to get that picture or that mind process out of somebody's thought because that's what happened to grandma. Grandma's going to go on dialysis. Same sort of scenario. So it takes a lot more education to try to demystify that effect of insulin, because especially if you loved grandma. And if grandma was an artist and now she couldn't paint or, you know, whatever. So that's a very powerful mis-message, so to speak. So use early, use insulin early and often, like voting. <laughs> or pee. Or pee. <laughs> <laughs> Read the pee. <laughs> yes, Dan. 
Uh, Dr. Collar, is it, <laughs> is it a common misconception that insulin is used only in type 1 diabetes? Uh, yes. Okay. So that's, yeah, that's another myth, that you don't need it if you're a type 2, you only need it if you're a type 1. Um, and we know that's not true because we know that mo the majority of patients, because they don't do that lifestyle intervention, progress to type or to progress to insulin deficiency, um, or at least not enough insulin. So yes, that's another myth. Oh, so this is a um, flow chart of a treatment um, algorithm. Okay, so type 2 patient, if they're asymptomatic, which again, they rarely are, it's okay to start with a, di a diet and exercise program uh, as long as you're going to do close monitoring uh, and at least monthly visits uh, with sugars and urines um, and an A1C at least every three months. Um, and that's only okay if the A1C is less than 7 when you detect them. If their sugar is 250 or higher um, and or they have symptoms and or their A1C is greater than 7, then starting with insulin is a good idea, especially with the blood sugar component of this. So I'll, I'll go back. A blood sugar above 250, the oral medications are going to take a lot longer to work and may not even work as well. So using insulin as the first line is probably the way to go to get them under control. And then you can add metformin down the road. If you can add metformin, and then if you want, you can attempt to get them off of insulin. But as I mentioned before, it's a great drug and you can continue the insulin. Um, the re you know, another reason to stop it is in kids is because of convenience. So if going to school and trying to deal with the rigor removal of that is an issue and you can control them on oral medications, that's great. But if you can, can't control them on medications or if they don't mind insulin or like insulin, then there's no reason to stop it. So do you start them on basal insulin, like a one shot at bedtime? As opposed, that would be the first insulin you would use? Yeah. Or, so you wouldn't immediately launch into short acting insulin? No. Or, so start with a basal, and a lot of kids can be controlled with a basal injection either once or twice a day, um, again, because they have enough insulin that when they get that bolus of glucose coming in for meals, they're able to make enough for that short period of time. Um, <clears throat> but, as, but depending on you know, how long they've had it, if they're a kid who got diabetes when they're five, probably by the time they're 25, they're going to need full basal bolus insulin. Um, okay, so then the other group, if the A1C starts to climb above 7, then you have to be aggressive um, and start adding medications such as metformin, insulin, a sulfonylurea. Again, I would avoid the TZDs um, to get them under control. Ultimately, you max out on oral agents and the dosages thereof, and then you have to add insulin. Another scenario that occurs in the adult world is they come and see you, you draw an A1C, uh, they go home, you forget to look at it, uh, they come back in three months, uh, you look at the A1C from three months ago and it was 12, and you're like, oh, well, let's just do another one. Because we don't know what it's at now, it's three months later. So then the same thing happens, they go home, you forget about them, and so, um, yeah. <laughs> So point of care testing has been a blessing in our clinic because it allows you to get the A1C right then and there and then you can talk to the patient about it. So a 12 would set your hair on fire. You would just go ahead and do one of these things. You wouldn't wait. Yes. <laughs> By 12, you probably needed to set your hair on fire. Well, I mean, again, in the, you know, my experience in the adult population is that they do you know, move a little slower. Whereas for a child, we would just pull out all the stops. We might put the kid in the hospital. We certainly set them up for three consecutive days in the clinic to be educated to death. I mean, all of those things. Right. You know, but it seems that it's a little slower movement. Yeah, and I don't, and, and so, I mean, it used to be, well, it still happens to me that um, unless it comes back to my inbox, I don't remember. Even for the in-office 
Right. So a lot of times for, for the, the electronic medical record, my name will get clicked on labs for people I have no I don't know anything about. And so I'm assuming that the people I do know about, sometimes their labs go somewhere else. And then you just get rid of it because it's not your responsibility because it's not your patient. Mm -hmm. So then I have to have all these checks and balances in place. So I tell the patient, so if you don't hear from me in a week, call me. So they have to call me and then I have to get the message. And then, you know, I mean, so there's all these things that can go wrong. Um, blood pressure is even worse because we use the excuse of white coat hypertension and say, well, we'll just recheck it in three months. And, and that then pr propagates itself. So, so being proactive early on is really important. And then being aggressive with medications is also important. And answer, the TODAY trial. This is a study that is ongoing now, looking at different options um, for treating kids with type, treating or preventing type 2 in kids. Um, so they're looking at three options, metformin, metformin placebo, or metformin plus another TZD. Um, actually, that might be the study I just presented. You've talked about I mean, you yeah. talked about this a little bit. Oh, okay. So they're looking at all these outcomes. I don't have, um, I think I just misordered. That was the outcome of that study. I apologize. So in that study, what they found was that metformin failed first and followed by combination drug. Um, but they still all work. So what are the complications of comorbidities of type 2 diabetes in youth? And are they the same as adults? Da, little man, big circle. <laughs> Destruction of beta cells in kids occurs at a rate almost four times higher than that in adults. Um, so it's accelerated. The percentage of youth who need medication to lower LDL has increased in the last 10 years from 4.5% to 10.7%. Lifestyle interventions didn't lower LDL in whatever study this is referring, but it did lower triglycerides, and we know that's the case in adults as well. And eye damage, fortunately, did not occur faster, but occurred at the same rate as adults. Long-term outcomes. Pima Indians, well studied because of their very high rates of type 2 diabetes. These were kids who were diagnosed before the age of 20. 22% 22 of them actually had microalbuminuria at diagnosis. And that increased to 60%, so tripled uh, in the next decade or so. Uh, a Japanese study, 36% had some signs of retinopathy at diagnosis that increased a little bit after two years. Um, they also found that 40% of patients who were diagnosed before the age of 30 had nephropathy 25 years later. That's pretty typical of adults, so not much different. Um, this is a study of 23-year-olds who had diabetes for nine years. They had poor control. Almost half of them were on blood pressure medications. A third of them had microalbuminuria, 6% on dialysis at the age of 23 with type 2 diabetes. 38% had lost pregnancy. I believe the normal rate is 15% of all pregnancies are lost and um, almost 10% of those 23 year olds had died. All right, so in conclusion, we know that the incidence is going up very rapidly. We know it can be hard to distinguish from type one. We know that puberty makes everything in life worse. We know that um, we don't tend to have that long asymptomatic or undiagnosed period like we do in adults, and that insulin deficiency tends to occur earlier, um, and that some of the comorbidities occur faster. I'm gonna just give you one case scenario that I did not um, put in, but when I first started um, faculty in 97, I saw a 23-year-old who have just been diagnosed with diabetes. Um, he went into the emergency room because of polyuria and burning with urination. 
And it turns out that he had an STD, but also had hyperglycemia. So they did a urine and a swab and found glucosuria and gonococcal. Uh, and then they did some more tests because of the glucose urea and his A1C was 25, wow. highest I've ever seen, and it was the wow. first one I've seen on faculty. Um, so he was put on insulin, came to establish care. So I treated his, finished his STD treatment, which is what you're supposed to do with a 23-year-old. And then we started talking about his type 2 diabetes and um, put him on medications, got his lipid panel. Um, his blood pressure was okay, and we started our talk about lifestyle intervention. And I gave him my, you know, 30 minutes, five to seven times a week, blah, 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 blah. And, and then he's walking out the door, and I'm like, don't forget, 30 minutes, blah, blah, blah. And he's like, but doc, when i going up the stairs at CNN to my class, I get chest pain and shortness of breath. So my door, my hand on the doorknob, ready to go see the next patient. So I gotta stop, come back in. We have to have this discussion. I'm like, you know, you're way too young, way too young. But let's just get an exercise stress test because he had exercise and do symptoms. So he went and had his exercise stress test and he passed. They sent him home. Two hours later, he went to the ER with crushing chest pain. Um, his EKG was fine. They sent him home. Two hours later, he came back, was having a massive MI, um, ended up having an ejection fraction of 25%. Normal is above 60. Seven, probably, seven. yeah. We start calling it class one at 60, I think. Um, ended up with a triple bypass at the age of 25. Um, so I think he had diabetes longer than two years. So he probably had it as a kid and didn't get diagnosed. So, so I would say the S-H-I-T happens, but I can't say the word because um, Kevin will bleep me. It happens. <laughs> so, so that was a pretty powerful case for me. Um, but then he did pretty well after <laughs> that. <laughs> Thank heavens for the STI. Yeah, yeah. So this would be a young man, though, who would stay on insulin, yeah. given yeah. that history. You wouldn't even go back to No. And now he works in the Social Security office, so he's close to where he's going to need to get his disability check. Um, but, yeah, that was just a, um, you know, a surprise. And nobody <clears throat> believed that any of these things could happen to him because he was 23. Right. Luckily, he told you. Yeah. Yeah. Also. Yeah. Because if he hadn't told you. Because first I was mad. I was like, I'm out the door. <laughs> That's a con. I don't know if that happens in pigs, but in adults, it's like, oh, doc, by the way. Yeah. And then they'll tell you something that you know is going to take 60 minutes. <laughs> yeah. And that you have to deal with. You have to deal with. The That's scariest right. words. Oh, by the way. <laughs> but I forgot to ask you. Yeah. All right, so questions, comments. Oh, this is Darren calling um, from Fort Yates. I have a question, a little bit more clarification on the lipid um, effects on the pancreas. Um, I talk to people about, you know, lowering the, the fried foods and so forth, but is there more specific information on that, of exactly what the effect is and how much and so forth is needed to really cause the effect? So the question is, um, I can... Lipid toxicity of the pancreas. Of the Lipid toxicity of the pancreas is that was being discussed. Oh, okay. So it's more that the fat, the excess of fat that we see in insulin resistance, mainly from triglycerides and oxidized fat, can get into the pancreas and cause toxicity to the beta cells that way. Uh, okay, so, so it's more of an indirect effect of the high fat, fried foods causing increases in triglycerides then. Right, and the body's okay. inability to use insulin to process those fats. Okay. All right. Does that make sense? Yep. Uh, so I'm trying to put this in, in usable fashion for patients because we've been asked to go into all the schools and talk about prevention of diabetes things with the all the kids. We're doing screenings of all the kids, and when we're done with that, I'm gonna, I've been asked to go out and talk in each of the schools to each of the classes. And so I'm trying to come up with something that would be effective with discussing it with them. 
Okay, so I would I would probably pose it as um, you know one it's a marker of of pre diabetes or insulin resistance and two it can make it go it can make you get there a lot faster because it it kills the beta cells. Are these children also overweight, Darren? Are they are these overweight children? Uh, about sixty percent of them are overweight or obese. Um, we had a thirteen year old in just the other day that was two hundred and fifty four pounds. Um, fortunately, he lost five pounds because I talked to him about three weeks before that, and he started getting more active and so forth. And I kind of gave him a high five when they, after he was weighed at 254, and the other people looked at me like, are you crazy? He's almost 250 pounds. And he's how old? 13. 13. So, you know, I'm just wondering in terms of framing, this is Kirsten, the dietitian, in terms of framing that discussion with the children and families, you know, the lipotoxicity is going to occur in many cell structures or, or many organ systems.